and experience of the European Union, which remains perhaps the most successful uh, example and template of regional economic cooperation. Uh, in this uh, session, we will move, uh, we intend to move from the general to the specific, from the overview to the core issues. Uh, namely the establishment of economic corridor and trade at border, which would play a crucial role in the evolution of a regional uh, economic community or union in, uh, in uh, South Asia. Economic uh, uh, and economic union uh, has a spectrum of dimensions and areas which include uh, trade, greater trade between the member states, uh, flow of capital and uh, investments, uh, and there is also the requirement of establishing uh, efficient uh, <coughs> uh, formalities and efficient processes uh, for custom clearance. Uh, there is also the paramount question of the restoration uh, or in some cases uh, resuscitation of the uh, uh, road, rail and maritime uh, channels of, of trade and, uh, uh, and connectivity. Uh, so <coughs> in this uh, uh, session we we have uh, a number of a number of presentations we'll uh, start with a special address by Dr. Nagesh Kumar who is head of the UNSCAP South and West uh, Southwest Asia office uh, we'll then have uh, remarks by Dr. Ronak Jaha from the Center for Policy Dialogue in Dhaka and uh, we'll have a lead uh, presentation by Dr. Prabir Day, Day from RIS uh, uh, who has been working on, on the topics that are under discussion uh, and the book that we that was distributed yesterday has uh, uh, has a rather long uh, article by, by him uh, on the very questions that are being discussed uh, today uh, and then we have three panelists, Dr. Gondane on my right, who is the Joint Secretary, SARC and Border Connectivity at the Ministry of External Affairs, and uh, Mr. Sharawat, who is the Chairman of the Land Ports Authority uh, on the left, of, uh, left side of uh, Nagesh, and uh, Dr. Dushni uh, Wirakon. Uh, Deputy Director and Fellow in IPS uh, Colombo, who's also uh, done a lot of work in this in this area. So uh, <coughs> I'd rather not stand or sit between you and the dis distinguished uh, panelists that we have. And uh, uh, may I therefore uh, request Dr. Nagesh Kumar to make his uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin by saying that it's such a rare privilege to have uh, all of one's friends in one room and to be able to catch up with them. This is such a wonderful feeling. And South Asia Economic Summit, if nothing else, at least this purpose is being served very well and I hope uh, we can do more, more than just that. Uh, the theme of this uh, uh, session I think is very critical for the economics of neighborhood that we talk when we are talking about regional economic integration. And uh, before actually going on to this presentation which some of you may be familiar with, I would like to join you uh, uh, sorry, join, uh, I would like to request you to join me in paying tributes to a very exceptional individual who contributed so much to the thinking 
on uh, the transport connectivity and bringing the cohesion and uh, exploiting the economics of uh, neighborhood in this region, uh, Dr. Uh, Rahmatullah, who was our former colleague in ASCAP, uh, a former director of the transport division of ASCAP, and who played a very instrumental role in the Asian highway, transition, railway kind of concepts that were evolved while he was there. Later on, after retiring from United Nations, he moved to uh, Dhaka uh, and he uh, became a senior advisor to uh, the Center for Policy Dialogue, uh, which Professor Soban heads and founded. And then he uh, did a very instrumental, very uh, major study for the SAC Secretariat on the uh, multimodal uh, uh, transport corridors of SAC, uh, which till date remains a very guiding document on the subject. So I would like you to join me uh, for observing uh, two minutes silence in his honor. He recently passed away. We all lost a, a great human being and a great champion of connectivity. Th thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, let me just uh, quickly go over uh, this presentation, which, uh, uh, because a number of uh, things uh, that I'm going to talk about have already been uh, talked at great length yesterday and this morning, so I can be very quick and, uh, uh, you know, uh, just flag the issues. Yesterday also it was mentioned, including by uh, Excellency Dr. Amunugama, that the world had changed, the world economy had changed uh, since the global financial crisis, and that uh, in that context, when the advanced economies, which were acting as motors or drivers or locomotives of the world economy, are going down, uh, slowing down, and can no longer provide this growth stimulus to the region's economies, regional economic integration assumes a greater criticality if you like, uh, and so, uh, so that is the context, uh, that is an additional context for uh, the SAC economic integration. And uh, South Asia, as we have talked about how, uh, you know, uh, how much potential remains to be exploited, as it is often talked about, the least integrated region, and we had done some back of the envelope calculations uh, uh, recently and which showed that potential of the interregional trade that remains to be exploited is very uh, large and it could be of the order of the broader southern Asia uh, it could be of the order of 170 billion dollars by in, fi in five years time so uh, the potential is, is very substantial then obviously the question is in your mind why that potential is not being realized and then uh, the, uh, when you begin to look at the barriers, uh, the connectivity emerges as the major, major uh, barrier. In fact, uh, region is better connected in terms of trade costs with Europe and North America than with itself. And, and in fact, ASCAP uh, trade cost database, uh, you know, uh, has the figures which show that cost of doing trade within the region is higher than cost of doing trade with Europe and North America. And that's largely because of poor land routes and transport facilitation. The India-Bangladesh uh, trade is a best example of this. India and Bangladesh share such a long, uh, you know, uh, border and also uh, many rivers and uh, coastlines. Uh, yet, uh, bulk of uh, India-Bangladesh trade is not conducted through borders, but through sea. And in that process, the benefits of 
geographical proximity and contiguity which yesterday uh, Professor Gohar Hijvi was talking about which is the essence of uh, neighborliness and proximity is not available to inter-regional trade. So the competitiveness of inter-regional trade is lost because of very poor uh, connectivity and that is the reason why we do not have the regional production chains that has become major drivers of growth across the world uh, have not formed in South Asia. So because regional production networks the essential thing is that you are able to get inputs just in time and across the border so, so some uh, vendor of yours is across the border but he is able to supply on your door uh, you know uh, just in time and if there are logistics and uh, connectivity and all these problems are there nobody can be sure. So, so that is why we do not have the uh, major uh, you know in, inroads into regional production networks. And while we have multiple overlapping frameworks for regional economic integration and cooperation in this region, including SARC, uh, which is the principal uh, you know, organization bringing together all the eight South Asian countries, but there is a parallel uh, you know, uh, other overlapping organization, uh, BIMSTAC, uh, ECO. Uh, which uh, brings together uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and uh, all of them have connectivity on their agenda yet uh, we have uh, not moved ahead and there are many bilateral and trilateral steps including the agreement to have uh, trial runs of a container train between India, Nepal and Bangladesh. So uh, the the other thing is the literature on uh, transport corridors, how they can be vehicles of uh, inclusive development and poverty reduction. There is a lot of uh, that uh, kind of uh, uh, analysis available on the table now and in including a study which uh, ASCAP had commissioned uh, a few years ago in the context of a larger uh, study that we were doing on regional economic integration, the growing together. Uh, we commissioned a group in Japan, in IDE, uh, to do a geographical simulation model to uh, work out uh, the economics of uh, some of these corridors on Asian highway route map for instance. And the study showed that once you develop a corridor uh, what happens is it leads to reconfiguration of economic activity along that corridor in such a manner that poorer and lagging parts derive most of the benefit. So it leads to much more balanced development at the end uh, uh, compared to the situation when there was no such corridor. So, so there are, I mean, uh, the real hardcore evidence on the table which shows that it happens. It leads to more inclusive and more, more balanced regional development. And then uh, there is also another series of literature which is about ne network externalities of uh, corridors and uh, net any networks like including telephone networks, you know, they become much more productive. The benefits of uh, these networks grow disproportionately uh, when you extend them. So extended corridors make greater sense than just connecting bilaterally one or two countries or three countries. So, so for exploiting network externalities fully, we need to talk about uh, extended corridors. So keeping all that in mind, I think there is a case in South, uh, South Asia and beyond, Southern Asia I call it, uh, the case for integrated transport corridors uh, across the sub-region to maximize network externalities and that is the kind of work that is the study which uh, Dr. Ramthullah led was trying to do to, build, do to develop some corridors which will extend across the region uh, and the ASCAP's uh, Asian Highway and Transition uh, Railway route networks or route maps provide very good guidance to connect these uh, highways and railways of the region to uh, get uh, the extended corridors. And besides making these, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, inter-regional trade much more competitive, such corridors can make Southern Asia a hub of East-West trade as it used to be in the times of Silk Route. 
and as Mr. Chairman himself uh, was pointing out, that many of the uh, links that existed, they need to be re uh, reconnected and revived. Uh, and uh, in that process, if we have these extended corridors, and I will uh, show you some of those proposals that we have on the table, uh, they will make every country a hub of the other state. So the interdependence, and uh, you know, mutual interdependence will, will develop and that will uh, particularly give a boost to least developed and landlocked countries in South Asia and Central Asia like Afghanistan, Bhutan and Nepal. Can be a win-win for the whole, whole region and they can be developed in a uh, building block approach as a part of an agreed master plan. And the other thing is that uh, financing wise, uh, it is often very difficult to raise resources for a corridor which connects two countries because volumes may not justify those investments. But once you talk of an extended broader corridor, uh, the viability of those routes increases and that facilitates uh, commercial viability and uh, financing becomes much more easier. So essentially, we have been talking of uh, two uh, extended corridors and one ag along the Asian uh, Trans-Asian Railway routes and another other along the Asian Highway routes. And let me just go into the, the first one, which we think is a low-hanging fruit uh, waiting to be tapped. And uh, this is uh, a route linking Istanbul, Tehran, Islamabad, Delhi, Kolkata and Dhaka and eventually to Yangon because there are some gaps there. But between Istanbul, Tehran, Islamabad, Delhi, Kolkata and Dhaka, there are no gaps. The connectivity is there. Uh, the railway lines are connected and all we need is to have an agreement or a soft uh, you know, uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, or soft infrastructure to make it happen. You, as you can see on the map, uh, I, I hope it is visible to the back uh, benchers. Uh, the Istanbul uh, to uh, Tehran to Islamabad uh, container train is already uh, running. It is operational after two years of dry runs. And uh, then uh, connecting it to uh, Delhi via uh, Vaga border and then uh, through the Indian Ra uh, Railway Network to uh, go to Kolkata and K Kolkata is again connected with, uh, with Dhaka uh, because the Metri Express is actually running. Uh, so all the way we can have connectivity without any uh, significant investments. Maybe a few lines will need to be upgraded or strengthened and that's all uh, about it, it would take. And then extending it to, uh, to Myanmar, uh, there, were, there are some gaps which need to be closed, but they uh, can be easily uh, done in the next few years. But as I said, one doesn't have to do it in one day. I mean, it can be done in phases. And so at least the DKD, uh, the ITI DKD part, you know, uh, because on both sides, uh, there is no break in gauge, there is no uh, problem, the, the railway lines are connected and uh, p passenger uh, express trains are actually running between uh, Delhi, Lahore and uh, Calcutta, Dhaka. So, and if that happens, if that happens, then we have uh, an extended corridor linking Dhaka all the way to Istanbul and Istanbul uh, through uh, Istanbul, uh, Europe. So it can revive a potential major uh, trade route that uh, would uh, look like uh, the old Southern Silk Road. Similarly, uh, highways of uh, the different countries along the same route uh, can uh, be connected. Well, I forgot to make, uh, make another point about this previous one. Uh, it's not only linking uh, the uh, Istanbul, Tehran, Islamabad, Delhi, Kolkata, Dhaka and Yangon, but also there are feeder links uh, with all different uh, uh, landlocked countries like Afghanistan, Nepal, Bhutan and many Central Asian republics along the route and it can also help in development of multimodal connections uh, in many cases. So, uh, and this is a, a map which I wanted to show, share with you. Uh, this is a map actually was developed uh, in ASCAP Transport Division some years ago uh, when we conceived of three 
major Asia Europe continent, uh, continental land bridges. And the first one was this uh, Trans Siberian Express kind of route from Vladivostok connecting to Moscow and beyond. The second one, uh, and that became operational. The second one was conceived as Shanghai to, uh, you know, Almaty and beyond uh, in Europe. That also became operational a couple of years ago. And the third one uh, was conceived from Istanbul to Shenzhen in, uh, in China. And the, what we are talking today uh, here uh, is going to be uh, implementing the third vision uh, that uh, SCAP had laid down many years ago. Now, if we uh, get these uh, uh, corridors uh, going, what would they provide is uh, potential trade channels connecting Europe, Central Asia, West Asia, South Asia, and also eventually Southeast and East Asia by hooking up to uh, BCIM corridor, Delhi Hanoi rail link, Kunming Singapore rail link. So many possibilities and the immense possibilities are there. And uh, many of these uh, things which we are finding difficult to trade between these countries, uh, including the energy supplies, for instance, uh, the, uh, we have been talking of IPI pipeline and TAPI pipeline for many years, but they require huge investments, uh, $7 billion to $10 billion per pipeline. And uh, once you have this grid operating, this corridor operating, there is no reason why uh, the oil tankers and gas tankers cannot be put on that train. And then uh, obviously for this uh, landlocked countries, uh, giving them this uh, access to regional and global markets would be a major gain. They can also be turned into economic corridors by developing some I infrastructure alongside. And uh, the, there was some e econometric uh, analysis, uh, uh, you know, Pabir had done for, for ASCAP, I'm sure he will share. We showed that these two corridors that we have talked about uh, are uh, making a lot of economic sense. So, uh, just to conclude, uh, I think uh, the time has come to recognize the criticality of uh, regional transport connectivity in the context of importance of regional economic integration as a new engine of uh, uh, Asia's dynamism for driving Asia's economic uh, growth, the way uh, globalization was driving it before the onset of the crisis, and adopting a master plan approach which can be developed in phases, you know, which has this, uh, all these different uh, extended corridors uh, could be very helpful. It could help in prioritizing physical infrastructure development, closing the infrastructure gaps, uh, addressing the facilitation bottlenecks that are there and providing for the, uh, the soft infrastructure that we lack uh, in terms of new agreements. Uh, as like uh, regional transit agreements that would be needed for facilitating the cross-border movements. It would also uh, help in ex exploiting the strategic location of Southern Asia to emerge as a hub of East-West trade, mobilizing resources for infrastructure development, and realizing the vision of integrated Southern Asia economic space or economic union that the conference is debating about not only connecting with itself, but re with the rest of the region. Now, just uh, one minute, I want to take about what ASCAP has been doing uh, to drive uh, this kind of vision. Uh, besides uh, uh, providing uh, the, uh, you know, auspices for signing of international agreements on Asian Highway, Trans-Asian Railway, and now the dry ports, the third agreement, which is open for signature these days, and many governments of this region are considering to sign that. Some have done that. Uh, so we have uh, been identifying these transport corridors linking Southern Asia and beyond, uh, like the ones I uh, just shared with you. Then uh, we have developed, uh, our colleagues in transport division in Bangkok have developed models of secured and efficient cross-border crossing, when, which we would need uh, when we do the third country goods passing through uh, the countries of the region. And in support of uh, these, uh, this vision of greater connectivity and facilitation, we have been organizing a number of policy dialogues. In fact, the first one was uh, organized in Dhaka under the chair or, uh, chairmanship of uh, Professor Gaur Rijvi. And he has uh, actually provided a lot of uh, uh, inspiration and stimulus to, to this work. 
The second one we did was in, in Lahore last December and uh, the Ministry of Commerce and Minister of Commerce Khurram Dasgir Khan Sahab was the chair of that and uh, the Railway Minister of Pakistan, Honorable uh, Khwaja Shad Rafiq Sahab also uh, graced this occasion and they were uh, both of them very highly supportive of uh, the proposals that we made to them. The third uh, in that series will be happening in, on 19th and 20th of, of this month uh, in Delhi and uh, the Asian Institute of Transport Development uh, will be our partner and we are expecting participation of senior officials from uh, 11 countries in this uh, region and uh, Professor Ridgvi has also consented to be uh, a very senior and special guest at that. Then we have done also some work and uh, we are doing more work on uh, connectivity's potential in development of lagging border regions. In everywhere else uh, in the re uh, world you find the border regions are more prosperous because most of the trade passes through that. But in South Asia, especially in Eastern, Southern, uh, Eastern uh, South Asia, I'm just concluding, uh, you find that the border regions are uh, the most backward and poorest regions and, and so, so how strengthening connectivity can help in that, that uh, we started a process last year and we are moving ahead with uh, further work and uh, then some workshops on the facilitation aspects of uh, this work are under pro uh, progress. So I'll, I'll stop here because I have really run out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you Nagesh for the very comprehensive and very uh, exciting uh, presentation. May I now request Dr. Ranak Jaha for her. Well, I, I, was, I was told that, but uh, is, are we going for the lead presentation? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gordani. <coughs> Gondani, the Joint Secretary, SARC and Border Connectivity of uh, MEA uh, India. Um, he will now make uh, make his presentation, and he has also requested uh, leave to leave uh, us after his presentation in order to attend to some urgent uh, tasks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chair, uh, fellow panelists uh, on the dais here, and distinguished delegates. I approach this presentation with a sense of trepidation. <coughs> In the gathering of high priests, is a layman coming like me and talking to you, and talking to the high priests of connectivity. To top it, the layman could be an atheist. <laughs> that may make it more complicated. <coughs> but we in the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs <coughs> realized the need for improved connectivity in the region. Connectivity which was seamless with good operational routes because of the vicissitudes of history went into dis disuse and therefore <coughs> part of it got, got obliterated. Some remain but unused. We thought we should be doing something and therefore in the ministry of external affairs we established a new division called the Border Connectivity Division. It was to <coughs> examine with the help of uh, the experts in the area to see what could be done if there are 
means of transport if there are roads and routes for transport why are they not operational there are rail lines but which are stuck at particular points there are roads but where the movement has to be restricted in such a way that trucks have to wait for 15 days at a time so it is not exactly whether the connectors are there or not that are coming as per the classical economist say says law says that you supply and the demand will cre be created by that supply in this case i don't think it applies there is already the demand there is supply but there is some link which is missing and we in the ministry have been trying to find out first and then to provide those gaps we have done that so with our rail connect connectivity with nepal we are trying to do building up rail links across the borders we are thinking in a focused way my friend sharawat is here about <coughs> building up icps in an expedited manner so that we don't run into difficulties we are building these in case needed across the borders this side of the border of course the lpai is doing a wonderful job you may have heard recently that the two agreements which were in the making in the crafting for very long time these were the emanations from the sark multimodal study multimodal connectivity study in 2006 and since then they were pending fortunately for us because we took a lead held the expert level meetings one after the other we got them through and hopefully the agreement on movement of motor vehicles will be signed during this 18th sark summit similarly the railways agreement is also ready and would be hopefully signed during this summit but road connectivity and rail connectivity <coughs> though desirable is not sufficient and enough and therefore there is already some thinking about air connectivity this was broached uh, by our delegation during the past two summits because we thought that this is one area which is conspicuously lacking at least in some sectors in the india sri lanka sector for uh, for example it's wonderful so 125 flights are uh, operating but like say uh, lahore uh, delhi there is a conspicuous lack hopefully if not because we from the indian side had expected that we will convene a special uh, standing se uh, standing committee session on connectivity during this summit this has been subsumed by other developments but connectivity will remain one of the three focus areas during this summit the two being the two other being trade and economic relations and the third 
in the people to people level contact in addition to road rail and air connectivity we see that the study had also recommended uh, maritime connectivity this we thought at the pan sark level because of course some are uh, 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 landlocked countries but at pan sark level it may not work at the present moment so we thought that we will have a sub regional <coughs> type of uh, uh, connectivity established and uh, a study was to be conducted by the adb on a sub regional connectivity between india maldives and sri lanka uh, 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 this is yet to come and when it comes hopefully we will move forward on this <coughs> area of connectivity in addition we are blessed with a lot of waterways there is a possibility that we can have inland waterways connectivity this has unfortunately not developed not even thought of in the in that focused manner as we have heard about uh, the road connectivity this is another area which we would be looking at in a focused way in the time to come friends once i had a chance to uh, sit in the panel with uh, ambassador muchkun dubey and uh, i rattled down the fact uh, figure so many kilometers so many uh, icp so many land custom station and thing like that and then at the conclusion of my session when the professor was speaking he said if you listen to mr gundane it would look as if and he quoted tennyson he said as if god is in the heaven and everything is good with the world <laughs> so i don't want to see say what all is being done how it is being done but i can assure you that our attention is there when we talk of the high priest and the gods i would also like to mention that if you build a temple nice temple and we see that the offerings offerings are reduced progressively and the devotees number decline we may not be so wise in building that temple there are roads already built if we are not using it maybe something is wrong with the road just as there was something wrong with that temple there we would like those obstacles which in the intersecting uh, uh, passages there are certain obstacles which disallow movement we in the ministry would try to remove those obstacles so that movement is facilitated once the movement starts restarts at an accelerated way there would be demands back pressures we would further expand our uh, liberalization so that the back pressures create value these values are transported <coughs> all across the region and further to the world thank you very much thank you uh, dr gundani uh, and uh, for for the efforts to not only improve the temp the uh, temples but also uh ensure that maximum number of devotees attend uh, may i now request dr ranak jahan from uh, center for policy that
dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, I initially thought that I will be uh, speaking after Dr. Uh, Prabhid Day, and uh, I will. Um, so that is why I first declined. But I thought that since most of my remarks would be uh, really from the perspective of a non-economist and a non-expert on technical issues, I thought that I would then speak uh, before him. I didn't realize that the previous speaker also had a time constraint. <laughs> and anyway, uh, I did read uh, Dr. Uh, uh, this um, uh, paper very quickly and also in the morning we heard um, uh, Dr. S uh, Selim Rahan and yesterday also a number of excellent uh, speeches but after reading uh, both Dr. Rahan and also uh, Dr. Prabhid they, uh, I must say that first um, I was um, they have excellent data which uh, persuaded me about all the economic benefits of a uh, closer integration. Then the f two thoughts came to my mind. The first thought was that if I am uh, so convinced now, um, how much the our policymakers, both political leadership and the bureaucratic leadership, uh, how much of this information is available to them and if available how much have they internalized all of this um, uh, information uh, the second uh, group that I thought about whether the general public how much of this information about all the benefits is available to the general public through popular media or other means and after all, in all of our democracies, it is the general public, the voting majority, voting public, who really sets the sort of priority of certain issues in terms of the political uh, leadership. The second thought that came to my mind is that all of these um, uh, papers and statements, they are mostly talking about all the benefits. And, but there must be some costs also involved. Um, uh, Dr. Rahan's paper actually did talk a little bit about the, why the customs union would have some benefits for some countries and some negatives for others. So I think that uh, really when one wants to sell an idea of a greater integration, particularly to political leadership, then I think there has to be a very explicit uh, analysis of not only you of course have to do the sales speech and talk about the benefits, but also I think one has to take into account, address what are some of the fears or what the um, uh, decision makers think may be the political costs or other costs and address those issues. So that in, I think, what I would have, I would like in future going forward that many of these papers which makes excellent uh, recommendations but basically based on economic data that they integrate their analysis say, a little bit with the political context in which really the real world moves. Otherwise the political context is actually regarded all as negatives that oh, we have excellent ideas but nothing much is happening because the political context or political sensitivities are there that is why we cannot move forward but even in the political landscape there could be certain forces which can be harnessed to move things forward and I think identifying even those kinds of positive political forces would be uh, useful so I would like to flag uh, three particular sets of issues that I feel that moving forward uh, research um, or, uh, uh, in this particular area of uh, greater integration uh, of the region 
can focus on or the papers could be much more integrated. First, as I said, that one should bring more clearly and, uh, 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 and the political analysis, uh, or the political economy of, uh, uh, of the context in a much more uh, f uh, focused way. The second set of, um, I mean, we, yesterday Dr. Gohar Rizvi and also others talked about um, that we were, South Asia was a community at some point. We had all the links. But we shouldn't forget that a very conscious and political decision was taken also in the last so many years to disconnect these links. So that to go back then you have to have a political process again going. And where are we at in terms of that political project? So I think that again, as, as I said, that these things are always dismissed and not seriously sort of uh, analyzed or taken into account in a, an integrated way. And I think this, you know, should, in moving forward, we should do that. Second uh, set of issues that I would like to focus on is that yesterday we were given an excellent paper prepared by RIS about all the recommendations and actions taken. And of course we have noted not only slow progress uh, and uh, big gaps between recommendations and uh, agreed actions, but also we, I think we have all noted that in some areas there has been some progress, but in others not. So I think it will be again interesting to see why in some areas we have made progress and not in others. For instance, I, th I find that there has been a lot of discussion or even in energy, for instance, there has been some agreements. And then trade, there is a lot of talk going on and also transport is another area also a lot of discussion and talk is going on. But I think if in, uh, we take a look at that what why in, what are the obstacles in some of the areas? For instance, obstacles could be, as was mentioned often, bureaucratic mindset. That's one set of obstacles. Some could be just the system. And if it is just the system, then there have been some recommendations such as electronic uh, uh, documentation and things of that sort. And then there could be, in some areas, that there are, uh, there are powerful vested interests or interest groups which oppose this. So I think again, some of these kinds of analysis will help us. Uh, we already heard about the security interests as one and political or economic interests as another. So that are they all going to get that in sync or not going to get that in sync? So I think a much more, I mean, I find that our sort of discussions often are not very frank or uh, holistic. And I think that kind of an analysis would be very um, uh, helpful. For instance, uh, Dr. Nogesh Kumar talked about the uh, railway transport and Moitri Express. Yes, fine, Moitri is going, but that journey is really a, a real uh, nightmare. The train moves, but when you come to the border, through the, uh, the immigration people, that takes hours and hours. So why would anybody spend hours and hours? So there are all these bottlenecks. Some, as I said, can be probably fixed much. So that there are various obstacles, different sets, and I think there should be some discussions of that. The, uh, Dr. Gohar Isbi is um, uh, sitting here, and he had been through many of these negotiations, say even on, uh, say, uh, uh, on transport and others. And we have seen in some areas there had been some progress. The, uh, first there was no progress, then there was some progress, and then nothing much happened. So if you have these ups and downs, why is it, I don't know, what moved it? And again, why did it not move forward? I think there has to be much more uh, uh, understanding of this, and I hope uh, Dr. Uh, Rizvi would share his experiences uh, about the political economy of some of these uh, uh, particular issues. One thing that, again, um, we don't talk much about, but again, if our final audience is the political leadership, then use of certain words I find is uh, 
often problematic. When I read these papers, I find there are corridors is used uh, by economists in a very positive way. The economic corridor, this corridor, that corridor. But I have to share this with you that in Bangladesh, certain political groups have trashed this word corridor. And so if you use the word corridor, it is regarded as in a very negative way. So you may not be aware of this, but if you go and talk about corridors to political leaders, and they have already trashed this uh, word, so you cannot then sell your product at that point. You have to think of another neutral term. My final uh, sort of comment is that yesterday and also today we heard a great deal about who are the drivers of change and India's role, that India has to play a leadership uh, role. And again, I think one needs to have much more um, uh, 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 discussion and really specification of what particular actions by India would be considered as playing a positive leadership role because we have also heard that India should be a leader, should carry all the weaker economies, but they cannot be like a big brother. So how can you carry others but not be a big brother? What are the actual concrete actions that would be the, provide the leadership that the others want? And then also, I think there was uh, Selim Dahan's paper talked about this, that uh, others also would have to chip in. So that who will do what? So that it really looks like a collective effort uh, and in a very positive way. I think we need much more deliberation on that. Uh, thank you very much. And as I said, since I was not going to make very specific uh, comments on uh, probably this uh, paper, I thought I could uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rana Jahan, for discussing the uh, connectivity of a different type. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> we now have our uh, main presentation by Dr. Uh, Prabir Day of RIS. Thank you, sir, uh, for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to make any uh, formal presentation uh, because the full length paper is already given in the folder. I know you already passed uh, half past 12, and, um, and after that, there are two eminent speakers. Dr. Kumar uh, eloquently covered most of it, Dr. Ranok Jahan, and previous speakers like uh, uh, Zim. Rolo, Professor Rolo, Salim, in previous sessions, they have extensively discussed about the relevance of economic corridor. Now, what I do, and we will be waiting to listen to uh, Mr. Sarawat to make his own presentation, which will be more exciting because he has some interesting facts and reality. Before we uh, uh, hand it over to him through chairman, uh, I uh, let me remind a couple of points that we, uh, we did the study at uh, what the paper we did for uh, for this, particularly for this occasion, this is the plenary paper three. Uh, what we looked at, um, recall the first, uh, second plenary, what uh, Professor Jim Rollo reminded that integration is not by the committee, uh, it is basically the people, the ideas, and things. Very correct. Dr. Arvind Mehta, in his uh, interventions, he also reminded indirectly that. And Salim Rayhan, all his uh, interesting figures uh, are also indicating that it's customs union. If it is not done properly, it may not be a win-win kind of situation. And all three, they perhaps wanted to say that, look, if we don't have uh, a kind of an uninterrupted transport corridor ac across the region, which is a very doable project, uh, economic union or further deepening of trade integration is, is a remote task. 
that's what actually Dr. Kumar, his underlying message was that. So what the paper actually said, that what we did, that how we look at uh, the economic union from the point of view that we have in free trade agreement, 5% interregional rate, very uh, high uh, informal trade, high NTMs, and everybody from since uh, the vice president's speech yesterday, and we are talking about the NTB's reductions. Uh, so, and I also recall uh, our chairman, Ambassador Sam Salen's very noted quote, which I always use, that border is a connector, not a point of conflict. Uh, so, the thinking of about the border as a barrier is, uh, is very fast changing, and we see particularly some developments in the, in the eastern side, uh, in the eastern side of India. So, this study here, we looked at that in the border trade, how much we do in the South Asia as the total. It was difficult to quantify the border trade figure or the trade at the border because even countries, they have a negative list approach. When they come to the border, they follow positive list. For example, uh, India's own trade with uh, Myanmar, uh, it has a 62 item as a positive list, so which gets a preferential uh, reduction of the duties. But in globally, India provides LDC benefit to Myanmar or any kind of trade that happened through India, Myanmar, not exactly through a positive list approach. So there are uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, so we see the border trade figures, uh, basically 300 million, and the total interregional trade in 2013 was the 22 billion. So border trade actually is very, very minimal. That to be between India and Bangladesh. And the informal trade, if you count, and if you quote from uh, Dr. Nisha Taneja's uh, calculations, very difficult to quantify. Uh, you cannot count the stars, and you cannot count the informal figure as well. But she could come out with some figures, and he's, uh, say that it is as good as 500 billion is informal trade. So this informal trade must be carried out on across the border, and if you leave out, set aside the trade which is happening from Dubai to Pakistan for the India's trade. So huge amount of uh, border trade potential, but we could not do because uh, the restrictions, barriers, etc. are there. Now, to go away with all these, we propose that let there be an economic corridor, and economic corridor means uh, it is a sort of, sort of transport corridor plus some development aspects. In the paper, we identify how we move uh, from transport corridor, road corridor to economic corridor. In between, there is an uh, called logistics corridor, somewhere it is straight corridor. If you move into the GMS, they have an economic corridor coming, uh, working, but if you come to the Karek, which is basically a trade corridor, but when it is coming to South Asia or any other parts, basically transport corridor. So transport corridor minus all the barriers and bottlenecks, it leads us to a trade and logistics to an economic corridor. So economic corridor means that you have a seamless movement of goods and vehicles and capital seamlessly, no internal problems and conflicts, at least the goods moving from one part of the country to another part of the country. It took time for the European Union. Jim gave a morning figure that it says 62, they came out an idea of a customs union, but they actually implemented in 68, but effectively it is on 1992. So Europe took more than two decades to come out with an economic corridor concept along with the eco uh, economic union. So South Asia's task is uh, very uh, difficult and challenging. I think we can overcome. And there are some progress. Dr. Rehmatullah is no more with us, uh, but he is 2006 study, and John Secretary from the Ministry, uh, when he said that he, uh, that couple of things, that's the report, uh, concluded, like motor vehicles agreement is going to be signed, uh, the SAC summit, and the railway agreement to be signed, and others. So that means something is uh, moving up, and that's very encouraging. At the same time, regionally, what we have, since we have a very good bilateral arrangement is moving in the South Asia region, so regional agenda is not coming up actively. And that has been reflected also in the trade facilitation and connectivity. Because if it is in India, Bhutan, or India, Nepal, uh, we are bilateral arrangements working perfectly. The countries, uh, they may not feel so quickly that we need to come up with a regional transit agreement or regional trade facilitation agreement. But there are some hazards and there are some risk or challenges. So they always uh, leave at that, that let's have a kind of a sub-regional adjustment moves. So we think that some progress in recently we have done, and it's quite, quite um, uh, interesting, even ASEAN has, hasn't done it. For example, accepting the e-signature. When you uh, put up the shipping bill or bill of lading from one country to another, the custom house agents, uh, those who are involved, the freight forwarders, they file online. 
and South Asian countries, every country, Afghanistan has made very good progress uh, because of the uh, some U.S. aid or uh, Bangladesh, uh, Chittagong customers, you know, Dhaka or India, for example, I get. So somehow the online filing of documentation is very advanced. What is lacking that we need to bring as a regional platform? That's SAC Secretariat has to do. That's a new institution they have to do. Uh, E-signatures, for example, that has been done, but not because of uh, the regional uh, secretariat that we have, that is because of India's unilateral interests. Uh, so e-signature means that uh, the, the, the reciprocal respect to the shipping bill, each others. So that is a big achievement. ASEAN is yet to implement. Uh, so and the common documentations. When you move from South Asian customs filing documentation, it varies. So many documentation we know, and it is a very very tedious work. So many things are there. But there is an attempt to move through a common uh, documentation. Those are, in the soft side, very good. But what's the problem is coming in the missing link between the countries. <coughs> and then economic corridor, the here it comes to narrow these gaps. Because if you go to the any border, the last mile, we call last mile connectivity, is missing. And for some reason, security reasons or lack of interest, lack of private sectors, uh, but those areas we need interventions and in the paper we have extensively said how we can cover uh, these uh, areas on the border into manufacturing zone or uh, special economic zones etc in the line with economic corridor. What we need in the way forward, we need a common template, common policy on transport. Very difficult because every country without having a domestic trust, strong domestic transportation you will be lose out. And we've seen it in different type of models that we don't have, if we don't have a back-end support or infrastructure, for example, uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan or Afghanistan and Central Asia or within India, eastern part or northeastern part, then we'll be lose out obviously because transportation costs will go up, our goods will lose its competitiveness and then this won't be any kind of an incentive to the enterprises and SMEs who will be coming out with an investment. So in the paper we looked at, if we look at an economic corridor, how and which way it can be inclusive, moving more into an SMEs in the projects. Now, <coughs> coming part, last part of my um, um, uh, that is uh, one uh, is uh, you, we need to look at uh, the micro issues. Karek uh, has done it. It is very difficult for them, but they, the micro issues means ADB is very interested. That's what uh, they have come out with an eight economic corridor, and these economic corridor they went into a very like regional guarantee, very important uh, insurance, driving license, acknowledgement. So those to be uh, in in. A, completely uh, negotiated by the countries uh, and uh, to start with we need to uh, move on and why uh, like transit I had an impression that transit is a kind of an regional public goods but fairly this is fading out from my mind because if we move across Bangladesh or Afghanistan transit will be good for them but they may not be able to manage it because neither they have it uh, expertise uh, neither, you know, uh, there's a the political things. So there has to be a kind of a regional arrangements for making a regional transit. A special vehicle, Bangladesh road cannot accept Indian trucks. Neither uh, Sri Lankan road accept the Indian loaded trucks. So there has to be a common systems, both in terms of software, in terms of uh, vehicle and movement. So those have to be thrust out. It is possible. Countries have done it. <coughs> and then the border, uh, like uh, Mr. Sarawath, who will tell he's an, he has done it, that why not we look at the land border uh, as an airport, 24-7 kind of, because border, it doesn't work 24-7, uh, and it is possible. Uh, second, and the last one is that when you talk about the regional value chains, if you see the composition within South Asia, there is an, not such regional value chain is coming, it is a kind of a production sharing in the, in the in case of cotton yarn, uh, but soon we come out with a corridor, you need to encourage uh, the fragmentation of productions and those need just-in-time delivery, earnings is very important. So on the earnings, the multimodal study that we did in 2006 doesn't talk about much. So there is a need to do a revisit the study to do a kind of a master plan, what Dr. Kumar said, 
uh, maybe uh, kind of a regional study we do uh, looking at all aspects. This is the upgradation or updation of the study that we did in 2006. Border infrastructure, testing, when you come to the non-NTMs, uh, you will find the testing laboratories are not there in the border. Even Mr. Saharawat is here, I, I won't hesitate to tell you that Wagahan Atari, the ICP, doesn't have a testing facility. So it has everything, but not a testing. So uh, not necessarily testing has to be done. Uh, they said that the border that can go to somewhere else, but gradually you move in, into there. Maybe 100 years from now, that border will not be there. All will be united and will move uh, seamlessly. <coughs> also, border infrastructure is very important, private sectors, and that's what we will encourage the border trade to grow. Uh, last word, uh, the the common set of projects we need and it is possible in the study we find that what kind of uh, projects that we immediately we can start. We have identified three road corridors, uh, one railway corridor, two air connectivity corridors and inland waterways between the countries. So these can be taken up by the SAC Secretariat or new regional organizations under the uh, SAC Secretariat to work more. And SARC regional trade facilitation policies is also required to give a guidance to the countries to set their own policies and also align with the regional arrangements. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Rabir Deh. Uh, we have two, two presentations left. And um, so may I request Mr. Sharawat, Chairman of the Land Ports Authority of India, to make his presentation. Respected Chair, my co-panelists from the dais, revered senior colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. Previous speakers have given a little introduction to you about the Land Ports Authority of India. Land Ports Authority of India is in the business of facilitating trade and people across the borders. LPI, in short, is just a two years, eight months, and to be precise, six days old baby. Yet in this short time, we have set up two integrated check posts on our borders. We are basically in the business of providing connectivity at our borders by setting up what is called as integrated check posts. Our purpose is to provide safe, secure, smooth and seamless movement of passengers, cargo and vehicles across the borders. The intention, the purpose of the integrated check post is to provide a single window service like the airports and the air cargo facilities for both the passengers as well as the cargo. Before these integrated check posts were set up, there was total poor, inadequate and lack of infrastructures. Besides, there was total lack of coordination and cooperation among the various agencies, be it the customs, be it the security, be it the immigration, be it the uh, photosanitary authorities and host of the other people like banks, etc., etc. I am happy to state here that the seed for the integrity check post was laid by a very senior colleague who happens to be sitting right here. That is Ambassador Mr. Sham Saran. It was in 2003 when he came up with this idea that there was total lack of facilities on the Indian side of the 15,000 kilometers long border. And he mooted this concept that we should have the integrity check post. 
and I am happy to state that we came up with the first integrity check post at Atari on our, on our western border with Pakistan and this was inaugurated in uh, 2013. In the very first year of its operations, I will be showing you some small pictures of that. In the very first year of its operations, the trade volume grew by 105%. When I am saying trade volume, it includes exports and imports, both for, uh, to Pakistan and imports from Pakistan. And it also includes the transit goods which came from Afghanistan to India. So look at the uh, thing what has happened, that a single facility, infrastructure facility at the border, saw a trade increase by 105%. And I dare say with humility that the cost of the infrastructure projects which the government of India has put in will be recovered within 3 to 5 years. No infrastructure project, even in the private sector, does this sort of a recovery. So, second integrity check post which we have set up is at a place called Agartala on our Indo-Bangladesh border. This is almost an year old facility. We are in the process of setting up the others at uh, Raksol on our Nepal border, Jogbani, then Petropol, More in, uh, in Myanmar. We hope to operationalize Petropol, jo uh, Raksol and Jogbani in this very financial year and we hope to do More by the year end of 2015. This is our first phase. In the, uh, it is difficult for us to go in a whole hog manner. The government of India has given us a mandate to set up integrate 13 integrated check posts, 7 in phase 1 and 6 in phase 2. I will be showing you the list of the 6 also. In this 7, you are finding one docky which is not there. Docky is in Meghalaya with Indo-Bangladesh border. That is also in the pipeline and we hope to complete that as a part of the phase 1 itself. The ICTs, as I mentioned to you, is they are going to be set up in the second phase also. These are at Hilly, uh, West Bengal, Changrabanda, uh, West uh, Bangladesh border, Changrabanda, uh, West Bengal, Bangladesh border, Suttarkhandi. Incidentally, Suttarkhandi happens to be on that Kunming, uh, Kolkata route itself. Kavarpuchi and Bangladesh, Sunoli and Rupedia is, is in, uh, again with Nepal. Out of these, you would find that Changrabanda is the one which provides a corridor connectivity for the transit goods between Bhutan and uh, Bangladesh. Uh, in Bangladesh, the place is called as Burimari. I'll just give you the, just a snapshot pictures of what it was earlier and what it is now. Atari. This is the first picture which you see right now of the passenger terminal building which we have at Atari. It's a state-of-the-art building and we, we cater to almost about 80,000 passengers per year on either side. And this passenger growth has also increased by 18% ever since we came into being. And then we have at Agartala. The point which I am trying to show is that these are the pictures. We are making modern, state-of-the-art infrastructure and providing all sorts of facilities to convenience and facilitate both the trade as well as the passengers. The intention is to reduce the trade transaction cost which is one of the highest in this region and also to reduce the travel time. People say and it is reported in the, the, that from New Delhi to, uh, to Chittagong a container takes 35 days. In fact, it has been reported earlier that at these places there is to be long queues of 5 to 7 to 8 to 10 days at both at Raksol as well as Petropol. Petropol happens to be the biggest land custom station for South Asia. The total trade at this place is to the tune of $5 billion. Out of this, 80% is India's exports to Bangladesh and rest 20% is uh, exports from Bangladesh to India. So this is the th thing which we are setting up. Petropol we hope to operationalize in this very financial year. Incidentally, Petropol handles almost 7 lakh passengers per year, which is the 12th highest of the any airport handled by our country. In, in India itself and we intend to set up an excellent top class uh, passenger terminal building there itself. There will be separate facilities for the arrival passengers and separate for the passengers. The intention is so that the security imperatives are also addressed totally and fully. What was before this? I thought first let you should uh, see this and thereafter I will show you what it was earlier here. 
this is the Atari then what you see is you see the passengers crossing like this with their own baggage there's nobody to assist them they had to cross on foot etc right now also it is on foot in a way but then we immediately uh, put them in a bus and provide them smooth movement and this is how it used to be the cargo used to be handled and the cargo used to be handled over head loads it used to be moving and in such a beautiful manner without stepping into the other country the cargo would move into the other country that is how these uh, head load carriers would do and what we have done right now is we have provided excellent facilities for the passengers if uh, i'm sure many of the people would have crossed uh, uh, into pakistan or from pakistan to this side and they would have had a view and we not only make good things we even maintain them very well hmm? that is what exactly i wanted to say and similarly for the passengers for the cargo also cargo there is a proper facility proper roads proper warehouses uh, proper rummaging facilities pr proper uh, parking etc and for all these we have provided banks uh, for, for the duty payment for the exchange of money uh, we have provided restrooms anything which you basically have at the airports we have it there the only thing is our scales are different and lower the reason being because at the airports the time lag is almost 2 to 3 hours whereas at our places it is just on foot it depends on the convenience of the person itself this is the atari but what we have done and now i will show you the agartala one agartala incidentally you see agartala what was then total slush area the goods could not be kept in open and th the beauty of uh, agartala is that at this place out of the total trade 99% is imports from bangladesh to india we hardly export only just about 1% of our total from this place to bangladesh so it basically the intention is to facilitate the exports from bangladesh and also at the same time to, to reduce the trade transaction cost and this earlier there was almost trade was difficult to do in the rainy season and rainy season in agartala happens to be twice in a year both for the uh, uh, the uh, in the monsoon season once in may to june and for the returning monsoons also then we have provided them absolutely state of the uh, uh, cargo complexes where the goods are properly stored where the proper place for examination etc similarly the earlier passenger building was on the lower side and what we have done is the picture which i had shown to the passenger without much ado i will not take much of your time the only thing which i wanted to suggest and recommend here is that why set up these facilities across the border within say 50 meters of each other with such a huge expense in cost why let the pers the goods be subject to twice loading unloading twice paperwork let us think of moving to a co location or to a single border stop station even countries in south africa uh, uh, who are relatively i mean backward visa vis us is concerned or if not backward under developed is the correct word in zambia zimbabwe kenya etc have adopted a single border station and what happens is today the same goods are loaded unloaded then documents are repeated they are checked twice which all impinges on the total cost itself and the total time being taken and what our intention is that we should have a single co -loca location single facility so that everybody gets to a win win situation ultimately who does benefit it is you and me who will be the consumers and the users of those final products which are imported at those places so and it is easily doable when the other countries have done in the world why not us we can even begin to do a template sort of a thing where we do not have a passport visa regime say for example it with nepal why create that huge infrastructure on both the sides for the simple loading unloading of the goods twice and it only takes much more time it leads to pilferage it leads to theft it leads to damage of the goods in spite of to so much of security having been provided to us accordingly i would only make a, a request to this uh, south seventh uh, uh, south asia economic summit here that we should urge the sar conference that wherever possible we should try and move on to a single stop border or to a co location facilities so that the region not only has regional integration but it also will be a step towards moving for economic union corridor etc etc whatever it is thank you very much uh <coughs>
Thank you. Uh, may I now uh, request Ms. Dr. Dushni Virakun of IPS to make her, uh, and that will be the last presentation. For that, um, we are not too late for lunch. Um, I must um, thank um, Prabir for the paper that he emailed, um, which I read um, have after having got to Delhi. Um, I don't think there's anything that I can add or, or take, um, uh, say something is missing. It's very comprehensive. It deals uh, with all the issues of um, trade facilitation, but less so with. Um, infrastructure connectivity, but I know Prabir has covered those in other papers that he has written. What I, um, I want to confine my uh, remarks to, I think, an area that is somewhat more neglected when we talk about um, regional connectivity, and that is financing. I know um, Nagesh alluded to it in his presentation. When we look at the literature also, we tend to identify what are the financing options. We talk about uh, developing uh, local currency bond markets, sub-regional financial uh, infrastructure pools, but it, it is um, an issue that tends to be glossed over in terms of also looking at it in terms of economic returns, the efficiency of those investments and the returns uh, not, on to, not only to individual countries but to South Asia as a whole. The reason I think that it is important is because when we are asking um, for better regional infrastructure connectivity, we are in fact asking governments to take responsibility or commitments um, to part finance um, that infrastructure uh, in, in, in terms of uh, taking them into their long-term infrastructure development plans. In today's global um, discourse, over the last um, two months or so, public finance infrastructure has come center stage um, to policy discussions. We have the IMF uh, managing director, I think last month, arguing very strongly for governments to ramp up public investment in order to um, revive um, global economic growth. We have had the uh, former US uh, Treasury Secretary, Larry Summers, he has written an article in the Financial Times he has titled it, Why Public Investment is Actually a Free Lunch. The title itself gives you a sense of the um, sentiment behind it. The latest IMF um, World Economic Outlook devotes an entire chapter, um, and the discussion is, is it time for an infrastructure push? I think the sentiments are also being echoed um, in, in the Asian region. We have had the establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, I think many of the South Asian countries have already signed on as founder members. Again, a recognition that infrastructure is central to Asia's um, intentions to continue to develop and grow, and a recognition also that current financing mechanisms are inadequate or may not be working. Now, financing gaps, I think, are uh, perhaps most felt in South Asia. We, have, we don't have um, even the luxury of some fiscal surpluses that Southeast Asian countries, East Asian countries have. We have the highest competing demands on public investment for basic sanitation in, in health, building schools, hospitals, um, providing housing, and large mega infrastructure projects then tend to get shifted down the list of priorities. But that is not to say that South Asian countries have not bought into the idea that public investment in infrastructure is a way of reviving growth. And here, Sri Lanka is a prime example of a country that has um, focused almost exclusively on public-led infrastructure as a way of um, driving economic growth. And India, we see in recent discussions, um, there again, India is also looking to revive India's economic growth through a uh, infrastructure-led um, development initiative. Now, options for financing are also, I think, becoming broader. We are moving away from traditional sources like um, ADB, World Bank. They come with conditionalities, long negotiation periods. 
um, some things that governments want to avoid and this is possible in what we today term um, the age of Chinese capital and Sri Lanka once again is a good example of a country that has tapped China for loans we have raised 5 billion um, from China for infrastructure over the last 5-6 years Sri Lanka has also gone in um, to international capital markets issued sovereign bonds another 5.5 billion over the last 5-6 um, years but there are downsides to that strategy and it's not something that South Asia collectively um, or even individually can um, sustain the downside risks are um, the IMF again two months ago they have released a um, study that has looked at public investment uh, particularly in infra infrastructure and they find that low income um, economies see only a very small positive uh, benefit uh, in the short run and almost no benefit going into the long run again related to um, the low levels of efficiency um, of investment um, perhaps because of the um, selection process um, of how we set about um, identifying the most um, cost-effective um, investment projects the IMF's um, World Economic Outlook also, although it advocates so strongly for public investment, again it finds that these kinds of um, uh, infrastructure investment uh, is self-financed in, in developed countries, but in developing countries they lead to greater indebtedness. Again, Sri Lanka is a good example. As I said, we've gone and borrowed, but and that has improved our connectivity. It has raised Sri Lanka's GDP growth over the last six years but there has not been a commensurate increase in our export earnings Sri Lanka's external debt service ratio has gone up and we are more exposed today to external debt compulsions if we then look at cross-border um, infrastructure initiatives what Nagesh was talking about the risks and costs of financing are even higher and they are even higher for South Asia because of the political risks that this region um, unfortunately carries. As I said, options, ADB, World Bank, these have been traditional sources, but their funding pools are not um, large enough to meet demand. We have uh, talked about sub-regional um, arrangements. Again, these are very much at the drawing board, um, insufficient funds. Public-private partnerships have not worked. They have, I think, there have been successes in very limited areas um, in the energy sector, in seaports, but by and large, private investors shy away from going into roads or into railways because of um, uncertainty with regards to their recovering their um, returns. So, and then, of course, we have the Asian Infrastructure Bank that has um, uh, just recently been established. We are not, we cannot say with any confidence how it is going to operate. Some South Asian countries, uh, sorry, some Asian countries, such as South Korea, have opted to stay out. Other countries like um, Australia have also opted to stay out, arguing that the rules and regulations governing uh, this bank is not clear. There are concerns about that the bank will be used by China to exert its um, influence uh, in the Asian region. Um, so we really don't know from the initial 50 billion um, US dollars um, if they will meet the 100 billion target and then what the next steps are going to be. So given that um, there are what the evidence suggests is that infrastructure investments give limited ret returns almost eroded as we go along is it that South Asia should then park this aside and say no this is too difficult um, there are easier things that can be done in trade facilitation um, less daunting in financial terms but clearly that is not the answer we do need better connectivity I think no one would argue about that but in order to um, pursue that I think at a regional level we need to focus on two things and that's I'll finish with that two issues one is with regards to uh, regulatory issues 
we have to harmonize our rules and regulations we have to have mechanisms to resolve commercial disputes we have to have mechanisms to recover funds um, I think it was um, uh, uh, Salim that mentioned or someone that mentioned there is a framework uh, of an investment agreement in place but those kinds of um, frameworks cannot s simply lie um, uh, as drafts they need to be finalized um, so that they provide that regulatory um, environment the second is with regards to um, governance and accountability these kinds of infrastructure projects carry huge economic rents and South Asia has a very poor record in insulating public investment programs from political decision making processes. We have poor um, governance and transparency um, in any index or indices that are developed at global level. You find South Asia is um, the countries that are identified as being most prone to corruption. So again, these issues of how to manage, how to select, how to um, ensure that the most cost-effective financing is being um, uh, used requires that we address issues of accountability and transparency at least at uh, regional le levels um, if we can't get it done at national levels. So I will stop at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Virakun. Uh, now, dear friends, we have already exceeded our, our time limit, so uh, I'm afraid we will not be able to have question-answer uh, sessions. Um, as far as the overall discussions uh, are concerned, I think we've had extremely uh, useful discussions uh, with reference to the progress that has already been made in the context of, of SARC, uh, SAFTA, uh, building up on, on SAFTA, uh, and uh, we've also had uh, a number of other, other steps, uh, the agreement on trade and services, uh, an agreement uh, on um, trade facilitation measures, harmonization of customs procedures and standards, uh, rapid elimination of um, non-tariff and uh, para-tariff barriers to trade, and there has also been uh, cooperation in, uh, in financial matters pertaining to trade uh, promotion. Now our discussions, uh, it will be impossible to to summarize um, all, uh, we've basically had uh, uh, three types of uh, 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 statements or uh, presentations. Uh, Dr. Nagesh uh, Kumar obviously looked at uh, the, uh, not only the connectivity issues and challenges in South Asia, uh, but also uh, referred to the efforts to promote uh, corridors between South Asia and East Asia on the one hand and South Asia and Central Asia on the other. And uh, uh, how uh, these, uh, these corridors uh, can help uh, in boosting uh, trade within South Asia and between uh, the other uh, regions of Asia, East and South, South and, and Central. Uh, <coughs> he also talked about the uh, need for further policy dialogues and consultations among the uh, South Asian countries and countries of uh, West uh, Asia uh, in order to, uh, to help uh, to encourage uh, the materialization of the corridors, uh, the two or three main corridors that he uh, identified. And uh, I think the next policy dialogue is going to be held uh, in 
10 to 15, uh, I think 19, 20th of, of November. Um, I have um, attended some of the meetings that have been organized by ISCAP, and I can confirm the, uh, the excellent work that is done uh, by the ISCAP in promoting the process of uh, integration and, uh, and cooperation. ISCAP also organized into after, in the aftermath of the food crisis of 2008, uh, ISCAP had organized uh, consultations on enhancing uh, food security in uh, South Asia. We had two presentations on the efforts that India has made on improving uh, road links, rail links, and maritime links uh, between India and, and Nepal, between India and Bangladesh, uh, and also the uh, uh, integrated uh, crossing uh, the land borders uh, between Pakistan and, uh, and India at uh, Atari Waga and uh, Agartala, uh, which will help in facilitating speedier clearance, custom clearance of, of the vehicles carrying goods. Uh, in the case of uh, <coughs> Pakistan, India, there is also the additional uh, factor of Afghanistan utilizing or being allowed to use uh, the same transit uh, arrangements for its exports uh, to India. And uh, that would put, uh, of course, additional uh, pressure should things in Afghanistan improve on the physical uh, infrastructure. Um, basically, what, uh, <coughs> what is obvious from our discussions is uh, that we need to improve the physical infrastructure uh, of connectivity. The roads have to be improved. The uh, the uh, rail rinks uh, have to be extended and improved and strengthened and established where they don't exist. Uh, and the same goes for maritime uh, transport. At the same time, the software of connectivity is also important. Uh, we have realized this in the case of Pakistan-Afghanistan transit trade, uh, that um, the authorities, uh, our customs, uh, and other officials uh, will have to enhance their efficiency and capacity if they were to handle uh, substantial increases in the, uh, in the transit trade between uh, our two countries. When we talk about South Asia connectivity, I mean, some of us forget that the three major economies of South Asia, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, once constituted a single market with absolutely unhindered uh, uh, traffic uh, connectivity of goods and services and capital and, uh, and investments. Of course, uh, you can say that the quantum of economic activity uh, and uh, the nature of economic activities, the scale and magnitude uh, have, have increased exponentially. So you will have to not only restore the pre-partition uh, infrastructure, but make vast uh, improvements, both in the physical infrastructure and in the software of infrastructure, the rules, regulations, standardization, certification, uh, and all that, in order to achieve the objectives of SAFTA and the ultimate objective of a South Asia um, economic uh, union which must remain uh, the aspirational as well as the, uh, uh, the practical goal that all uh, uh, our efforts must be directed at achieving. So thank you very much and um, uh, I think if maybe there are announcements about the afternoon sessions but the afternoon sessions should start as, as scheduled, uh, since we have enough time for lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, we got late by 20 minutes, uh, but we take our lunch quickly uh, and come back at uh, 2 o'clock again here. Thank you. Have your lunch. Food is ready.